The Prophet ﷺ, this is in Sahih Muslim, said, يَعُوذُ عَائِذٌ بِالْبَيْتِ يَعُوذُ Just like when you say, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ You seek refuge, you seek the protection. So, يَعُوذُ عَائِذٌ بِالْبَيْتِ So, someone seeks the protection with the house, meaning the Kaaba in Mecca. Or, the more correct translation, a person will seek refuge at the house, meaning the Kaaba in Mecca. فَيُبْعَثْ إِلَيْهِ بَعْثِ so an army will be sent to him, meaning sent to kill him. So فَإِذَا كَانُوا بِبَيْدَاء مِنَ الْأَرْضِ So when they reached the open ground, okay, and then an area called al-Bayda, which is an, just an open area, open space with no houses in it. خُسِفَ بِهِمْ The earth will swallow that army up. Alright, so someone seeks protection at the house, and then an army is sent to destroy him, and when they reach this open area of Bayda, the earth will swallow up that army. قيل يا رسول الله to the companions they asked يا رسول الله فكيف بمن كان كارها What about those that were coerced to be part of that army? So the earth swallows up the whole army. Not everybody's a bad guy there. What about those who were forced to come out with this army? They didn't want to, but they just compelled. They said, okay, I'm going to go, but I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to hurt anybody. And then when they get to this open area, the earth swallows them up. What about these people? قَالَ يُخْسَفُ بِهِ مَعَهُمْ وَلَكِنَّهُ يُبْعَثْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ عَلَى نِيَتِهِ The Prophet ﷺ said he will be swallowed up. The earth will swallow him up as well. He will be swallowed up with them, but he will be resurrected on the day of resurrection, on the Yom Al-Qiyamah, based on his niyyah, based on his intention. So those who went there with ill intent, with intent to kill and do this and that, they'll be resurrected based on their intention. And then others who went there because they were forced to, but they didn't want to harm anybody, they'll be resurrected on the Day of Judgment based on their intention as well. We said if you put them all together, you get a more complete picture of the story of the Mahdi. Which I'll tell you something interesting. Um, when you put them all together, you see uh, a story that makes sense chronologically, the events make sense, it's a complete story. You understand? You know like when when you have, let's say, 10 people, and each one of them just by themselves uh, gives one part of a story, and then you put it all together. Is it going to be coherent? Is it going to make sense? The answer is no. What am I really saying here? There were some people, you know, some of the contemporary, you know, I'm not going to call them scholars, but just, I don't know, pe speakers, all right? And uh, this is like in the Arab land specifically. And a lot of them challenged the, the, the story or the authenticity or even the idea of the Mahdi. Uh, even though we have authentic hadith, we have weak hadith and we have um, plenty of authentic hadith that speak about the Mahdi and his coming and everything. They said, no, this stuff was just put together, was fabricated, it was not, you know, it was just glued together, made up by people who were deviant and people who were uh, intending to scare and terrify the Ummah. Then how do we have such a story, a complete story with no contradictions? That's the real question. If random people with bad intentions throughout the Ummah, ummah faked these hadith about the Mahdi, then the story wouldn't make any sense. It wouldn't have a beginning, middle, and end. It would just be, okay, one time the Mahdi is here, one time he's over there, but that's not the case. It's something to think about. The Prophet ﷺ mentions that a Khalifa dies. Then a civil war will break out. So, as a, so uh, a person from my Ahlul Bayt will leave Medina running away from it to Mecca, okay? So what do we have so far? We have a Khalifa that dies. So we, there's got to be a Khilafah, and then the Khalifa dies, then there's a civil war. Another hadith says three sons of a Khalifa. You know, they pull the Ummah into the civil war, the likes of which the Ummah has never seen. So a person from my Ahlul Bayt, from my family, meaning from my lineage, يعني, will, shall leave Medina, running away from it to Mecca. From Medina to Mecca. And the fact that he was running away, the scholars mentioned that it indicates that he was targeted, that someone was interested in him or had something about him. So they were looking at him carefully and he's targeted. So they sent someone or a group after him. So he leaves Medina and he goes to Mecca and he shall reach the Kaaba. And people will force him out of his house. Oh, remember what I said last time? People force him to, to give the bay'ah. Whereas... Everyone who claims that they're the Mahdi and you should follow them, they are asking you for the bay'ah. He doesn't want it, they force him out of his house and give him bay'ah between the Rukn, the black stone, and the Maqam, Maqam of Ibrahim. So right in that area, he will stand 
and people will force him to accept the bay'ah. Then uh, the Prophet mentions, then Muslims from Khurasan will go to join him. And he says, when you see the army, give bay'ah to the Mahdi. Okay, well the hadith mentions that if you see him, if you, if you know and hear of the Mahdi, get to him and crawl, even if you have to crawl over snow, to give the pledge to him. Um, all right. He says, I saw in a dream something very strange. The Prophet ﷺ mentions this hadith. I saw in a dream something very strange. A group of people from my ummah will intend to attack the Kaaba because a man from my descendants has sought refuge in it. It's very similar to the other ones, just seeing it from a different angle. As the army is camped at Bayda, uh, the Allah will cause the earth to open up and swallow the army. Hmm. Okay. So let's do, do a quick recap here, combining the narrations together. We see that the Mahdi will seek refuge in the Kaaba. There will be some political turmoil, civil war. He leaves Medina to go to Mecca. And when the, an army is sent to destroy him while he's in Mecca, and then while they're at this open area of, of Bayda, the earth will swallow them up. And uh, then he will lead, then people will give him bay'ah between the black stone and the maqam of Ibrahim. Then people will, we said unanimously, and just everyone will know this is the Mahdi. There will not be you know, people on the sidelines, righteous people. Is that him or not? Everybody will start to give pledge to him. And when you hear of him, you have to make sure you go across whatever distance and you pledge to the Mahdi. He will lead the entire ummah and the whole ummah will be united and this will be the greatest khilafah ever, as some scholars said. He will give money to everyone and he will, uh, you know, there will be peace and there will be, you know, tr com you know what is it, safety and all that for the first time in a long time. In Surah Abu Dawood, the Prophet ﷺ mentions, يَمْلِكُ سَبْعَ سنين. He will rule for seven years. And then the Dajjal comes. So this happens, all this happens, and then the Dajjal comes during the time of the Mahdi. And the Mahdi then, even though he knows he cannot kill the Dajjal, he puts together an army and they fight against him on day one. Now, with the Dajjal and stuff, of course, we're going to get to all these details when we get to the Dajjal. But our point today was the Mahdi. And then, uh, on, so they have a fierce battle against the army of the Dajjal. Then on that, so they go, they go to sleep at night. That morning, that Fajr, they make the Iqama. And right before the Mahdi you know, moves forward to lead the Salah, all the believers, they look up and they see Isa alayhi salam, Isa ibn Maryam coming down. And the Prophet specifically mentioned with one hand on the wing of one angel, the other hand on the wing of another angel. He describes the garment he'll be wearing, its color, his hair, what it looks like, and he comes down right amongst the believers. And so they rush to him. They rush to, to Isa alayhi salam. And he wipes over their faces and he tells them their, their rank, their place in Al Jannah. And then Al Mahdi tells Isa ibn Maryam, Taqaddam ya ruh Allah. But Isa ibn Maryam pushes him from his shoulder like this, and he tells him the iqama was made for you. Now, a number of things here. One, why is that? Why does he lead, why does the Mahdi lead the great prophet Isa alayhi salam? Because number one, the scholars mention that the Mahdi has the Quran, and Isa alayhi salam has the Injil. And which one is superior? No doubt, it is the Quran. Two, they said to indicate that he's not coming as a new prophet. Rather, he is coming as a follower of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. That's why some scholars said something interesting about Isa alayhi salam. They said this actually uh, makes him a companion as well because he saw the Prophet sallam, how? During the ascension journey, he met the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and of course believed in him as a prophet. And so in that sense, he fits the bill of being a companion, a sahabi. I said that in class one time and a student put their hand up and said, Okay, and the people who see Isa, do they become the Tabi'een? And of course, the answer is no. Um, uh, but also, so those are the two reasons. The third one is that also as, a, as respect that this man assembled this whole army and he's leading them and they already made the Iqama for him. So as respect, he let him lead. And what's interesting is after this point, we do not have a single word about the Mahdi after this. Not a single word about the Mahdi. We don't know if he lives until the time of Isa, salam, continues living and 
just goes into retirement, has children, gets married. We don't know if he dies. We don't know anything about him after that. And the explanation is now the real star, Isa has, has shown. So at that point, really, nobody cares about the Mahdi. I mean, there's no comparison between a Mahdi and a prophet. And a Mahdi and one of the five greatest prophets of Allah at that. So, um, but since we're more or less kind of done with the Mahdi, let's look at some other quote-unquote Mahdis that have, um, that have shown up in, in, in history. All right. There was, uh, let's start with what we mentioned last time that some of the, the Rafidis, what they used to be called back then, today we call them the Shia, claimed that uh, the Mahdi is the last of their 12 Imams. So these are the 12 Shias. The Mahdi is the last of the 12 Imams. And his name will be Muhammad ibn al-Hasan al-Askari. And they believe he's from the descendants of, of al Hussein, not al-Hasan, as we Sunnis believe. They believe that he entered the tunnel of Samarra in the year 260 after the Hijra. Yani the Mahdi was alive. So in the Sunni belief that if you're not living at the time of the Mahdi, he's not born. And if you, yani 500 years ago, the Mahdi was not born. We don't believe that he's alive on earth and hiding somewhere. But these people here, they said that he went into this cave in Samarra in 260 after the Hijra. So he was alive, went into that cave. And he's not going to come out until it's time to come out. One very important thing to remember when you do something like that, like that or extreme Sufis who say Al-Khadr, the Prophet Al-Khadr who, who met with Musa Alayhi is still alive. When you say the Mahdi is alive and well or the Al-Khadr is still alive and amongst us or like some extremists also say the Prophet Sallam is still alive and he was here and he prayed with us and all that. <laughs> I'll tell you a story. There was uh, one of, uh, one of the, the shiukh that I studied with. He was in Medina. He said, and uh, after the salah, we prayed there. And after the salah, I saw someone turn towards the Prophet Sallallahu and make dua. He said, the guy was a redhead, so I thought he was a westerner. So I went to speak to him. So when I got to him, it turns out he's Arab, just looks like that. And he said that, uh, he, I told him, Ya khay, we should always make our dua to Allah Azza wa and to Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala alone. Do not pray to anyone else, no intercessors, nothing. And because, as you know, the Prophet ﷺ has passed on. And he tells him, no, the Prophet ﷺ is not dead. The Prophet ﷺ is amongst us. And he actually just prayed Aisha with us. So, like, what do you say to someone like that? So the Shaykh just said, Prophet ﷺ just prayed Aisha with us? He said, yeah. He said, then why don't you make sure that he led the Salah? <laughs> Makes sense, right? Like, who is going to lead the Salah and the Prophet ﷺ is in is in line somewhere. Stowi. No, you stowi. You stowi. So, anyways, the point is that there are these people who believe the Prophet is alive and, and, they like, and they try to make it look like it's an honor. But what you're doing, let's pick any here, uh, the, the Mahdi, the Al-Khadr, and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if you, if you say any of these three are alive, and like the Shia say, the Mahdi even knows what's happening on earth right now then is this a plus or a minus? It's a huge negative, it's a huge minus to be alive and see all the destruction and all the death that's happening to, to the Muslims. Muslims are dying by the millions. By the millions. And you're just sitting there and you're not saying a word, Al-Khadr, what is he doing? Huh. Every time in Sudan, every few months, they write an article in the newspaper that they saw Al-Khadr in the, in the vegetable market in this city or that city. And he's always at the vegetable markets because he's khadr, green, you know, vegetables, green. So you tell me, you know, millions of people died in Iraq and he's just walking around the vegetable garden, vegetable market with some uh, leaf, uh, lifts and mush'arif <laughs> radishes. Doesn't make any sense. It makes the person careless. Tell me the Prophet is alive. Tab, let's consult the Prophet on all the... Thousands of problems afflicting the ummah right now. Not just wars, economies, everything. Doesn't make any sense. Or the Mahdi is alive. So what are you waiting for? And he goes to a cave a thousand years ago. What do you do in a cave? They're punching bags and training in that cave or what? Doesn't make any sense. It takes away from the greatness of the individual when you make them alive and careless. Right? Anyways. 
Now, the, what's funny is they believe that when he entered the tunnel, he was five, and uh, the cave, he was five years old. So like a five-year-old just wa walking to a cave is like, okay, see you in a thousand years. I'm going to stay here for a while. Like even a five-year-old, like, as an adult going in, خلاص, you contemplate, you make dhikr. A five-year-old, what does a five-year-old know, Aslan, to, to prepare? Anyways, that was some belief about the Mahdi. Others, uh, there was uh, a man we said by the name of Abdullah ibn Saba, and he claimed that Ali ibn Abi Talib was the awaited Mahdi. And uh, poor Ali radiallahu anhu, they said he was the Mahdi. All right? They said he was supposed to be the, the, not the Khalifa, the Prophet. Then they said, astaghfirullah, some group during his lifetime said he was Allah. Astaghfirullah. Then some people said he was the Dabba. The Dabba is the beast that comes towards the end of time. We're going to talk about it, inshallah. They said he was the Dabba. And the scholars argue there's no, there's never a time ever in the Arabic language when you refer to a human being as a Dabb. But they're just trying to make Ali radiallahu anhu everything. The third, um, this man by the name of Mukhtar ibn Ubaid al thaqafi he claimed that Muhammad ibn Hanafiya was the Mahdi. Of course, Muhammad ibn Hanafiya never said that. But we kind of mentioned that last time. We said Muhammad ibn Hanafiya was the son of Ali ibn Abi Talib. But from, not from Fatima, from another woman. Her name was Khawla bint Ja'far. Khawla bint Ja'far, she was his mother. And she was from Banu Hanifa. So she became, he, she was known as Al-Hanafiya. So he became known as Muhammad, the son of Al-Hanafi. Of course, he was a righteous man. He never claimed to be the Khalifa, but they, people, or this man specifically, said he was the Khalifa.